right, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and the governor's March 15th order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place due to the outbreak of the coronavirus. This meeting of the town of Berlin select board will be conducted by a remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. The town of Berlin will use best efforts to post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's webpage, the town's YouTube channel. Approved minutes will be posted to mytowngovernment.org. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to attend the virtual meeting may attend via the Zoom webinar platform in one of two ways, with both audio and video access or by telephone audio only. Should any board member have technical difficulties and or lose access to the meeting, the meeting will recess for a period of time to see whether access can be restored. If not, the meeting will be continued to another date agreed to by a majority of the board or adjourned until our next scheduled meeting. You'd think I know that by heart. I was gonna say, Chris, you should I just you could if you tried. that. Oh, I doubt it. I don't know. But anyway, so we'll call the meeting to order at 7.03. Um, we have approval of the December 28th open session meeting minutes. Um, do I hear a motion or comments, questions? So moved. Second. Okay, we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. And that's unanimous. Uh, Margaret, do we have any correspondence this evening? There is, there is no correspondence for tonight. Okay, um, we're on to general public comment. Mary shaken no. Nope. All right, well, yeah. do we want to start um, the general department update? Yes, please. All right, then we'll have to promote our police chief. Tom Galvin. Hey. Ah, how are we doing? Good. Hello. All right. Happy New Year. Yeah, you too. It's uh, it's got to be better than 2020. Yes, it does. I shouldn't say 2020 was bad. 2020 was just different. <laughs> um, well, different, <laughs> and glad it's in the rear view. <laughs> yeah, but we'll see. I'm not tempting any fates. <laughs> yeah, I forget what did I see. Something about. What was uh, I can't remember. Well, one of the movies about the future, and it was it was a twenty. It was actually twenty twenty one. Um, so I was like, uh oh, we'll see what happens now. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> what it is. I'll probably There's probably a Simpsons episode. They're pretty good at predicting the future. <laughs> they, they're actually really good at predicting things. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, relatively uh, quiet month again, which is you know kind of been a common theme throughout COVID. Um, but just some old things that are still kicking around. Um, uh, return the grant paperwork, uh, and, and I'm just waiting for signed copies from the state uh, on the body cameras. We'll be able to um, look at making some purchases. Um, and as we've talked about plenty of times um, in December, we wrapped up the, uh, the shared streets and spaces uh, program. Um, but in terms of the police department for uh, December, um, just under 750 in incidents for the month, um, 16 motor vehicle crashes. Our crash numbers were definitely up. Um, a lot of it was weather related. Um, that December 5th storm, um, I believe within about a two hour period, we had like seven crashes alone. Um, one that hit a house. Um, that was that Saturday midday kind of storm that hit us hard when everyone was kind of out. That, that was the, has kind of been the toughest storm that we've had this year, just uh, how quickly deter uh, conditions deteriorated on the road. Um, you know, fortunately DPW was able to, to rectify that relatively quickly, but we had a really tough, uh, tough two hour period. We had Colvin Road closed with a pole down with a transformer on a car and uh, just some some pretty nasty crashes in a short period of time. Um, it, uh, two actually rollover crashes and then uh, only four cases of criminal charges. Um, and I'll talk about one of them in a minute. Um, but just on those rollover crashes um, where our numbers were up, um, one was uh, December 10th. Um, and that was really a reckless driving type of condition, uh, gentleman driving on West Street. Um, went off the road, hit a fence, hit a pole, did some damage to uh, some steps on a, some someone's home, 
and um, they actually fled the scene. Um, fortunately, the uh, the officers did a great job in following up. And, and about an hour after the crash, just in continuing to check uh, the area, they noticed a, a van that was kind of out of place. It had been driving around, and it was uh, it was in a driveway on Boylston Road, where the officers, you know, being from the area, are familiar with the vehicles that are usually in that driveway. It didn't fit, and uh, it was actually people coming to pick up the operator of that vehicle. Um, so we were able to uh, to solve that and uh, get the necessary restitution, uh, or it's going to be through the insurance process for the uh, the property owners that had damage. Um, and then we were very lucky on December fifteenth. Um, had a young woman who was driving on South Street, and uh, just a small section um, where we had some of the melt during the day got wet, um, black ice froze over, and um, she lost control and actually rolled down the embankment on South Street, kind of near Jones Road. And she became pinned in the vehicle. Um, her hair actually, had, she had a, a ponytail that got pinned underneath the car. Um, so they ended up cutting her hair off in order to, to get her out. Um, but she was very lucky, just the way that uh, the vehicle was damaged and her, her hair was outside of the vehicle. Um, it could have been much more serious. She actually walked away and, uh, and didn't go to the hospital. Um, if, if you remember last month, I kind of told you about a crazy little incident we had um, at the mobile that kind of culminated at the mobile station with a, um, a subject running away from the ambulance and we had to have a canine. Um, well, we ended up with another stolen vehicle related incident this uh, on Christmas night, actually. Um, officers received a call from the London to Great New Hampshire Police Department um, about someone that had stolen a vehicle that they were able to identify and knew that they had a contact and an acquaintance here in Berlin and uh, that they may be heading to that address. Um, and I guess looking at what happened, unfortunately, um, the officers located the vehicle um, and uh, with some assistance from Marlboro, uh, Hudson and Bolton were able to take the subject into custody. Um, he also had several outstanding uh, default arrest warrants. Um, so he actually was held for the entire holiday weekend. And um, while in custody, he, uh, he actually clogged the toilet in one of the cells, caused it to overflow, um, flooding actually two of the cells, the entire booking area out into the, the Sally Port. Um, we actually brought in a, um, it's actually a crime scene cleanup company, but they handle biohazard and things like that on Monday to actually clean the entire cell block and disinfect the area. Um, but we also learned um, through this that this subject that we had in custody was the same person that we had in November. Um, so actually in November, he had provided a fake identification um, that actually belonged to a friend of his that died of a heroin overdose. Um, so we've been able to tie that case together as well as some other cases together that this person has used with, uh, with a fake ID, not only in Berlin, um, but in New Hampshire and, and other areas across, uh, across Massachusetts. Um, it was just a, it was a tough incident. Um, again, and, and I explained this last month um, when we had transported this individual to the hospital, there's someone that, that they're a person that's, that is in some, some crisis, um, but they were released from the hospital, our custody. They went to court, they were released from the court. They've now committed additional crimes. Um, while they were in our custody, were again transported to the hospital and again released from the hospital. And, um, and now they're actually being held through the court. So um, hopefully he's getting some of the help he needs with addiction and, and other mental health related issues. Um, but again, I talked about the breakdown um, that we've seen with the system. And uh, you know that, that once we're getting some of these people to the hospital that need, need help and are in crisis and we're not getting that, uh, that assistance from the hospital. So we're still trying to, trying to work that out. Um, I've had some introductory conversations already with the incoming interim police chief that will be uh, in Clinton. Um, Lieutenant Brian Coyne is taking, taking over from Mark Levenger. Um, if any of you know Mark, Mark has been there, um, I think since the beginning of time. Um, he's been chief for over 30 years at this point and he retires tomorrow. Um, but in talking with Brian, uh, he is uh, very willing to begin to work um, to try and, and uh, work on some of the grants that are available to uh, to get like a joint mental health clinician that actually would ride with officers. Um, probably it would be we would have to expand beyond, I think, the borders of Clinton and Berlin, um, but include some of our other neighbors um, and have some of those people available to us immediately, um, you know, and actually in the car some nights with our officers. So we're going to continue to work on that program and see what we can do. Um, to find some funding to uh, to do that. Some of our other neighbors have been able to do that. And it's one thing that I've been interested in for quite a while, but uh, haven't had the support in our neighboring communities to kind of get that done. 
Um, as I had talked about last month, just briefly, we did sell our last police interceptor, um, kind of a bittersweet moment for the Crown Victoria to go, but we did uh, make a little bit more money than we expected in, in selling that. Um, also this past month, um, began the process um, for certification and accreditation. So um, in Massachusetts, we have a police accreditation program um, where police departments go through a voluntary review of policies, procedures, uh, facility, equipment, uh, and um, are either become, initially become certified if they meet uh, the necessary standards and then can work towards accreditation. Um, as we look at police reform that has, you know, it's been another uh, hot topic and actually the bill was finally signed last week. Um, and we're still kind of going to see what, what that's going to mean for us. Um, but these are things that, and this is something that, that we need to take on. Um, you know, we have a relatively extensive policy manual, um, but we need to put that up against everyone else's, make sure that we are um, living up to the best practices um, for policing uh, and that we're, you know, really managing our risk for, uh, for the police department and for the, uh, the town of Berlin. Um, there's an annual fee associated with the, uh, the accreditation process. It's an $1,800 fee uh, yearly for an agency our size. Um, but there are some reimbursements that will be available through, through Maya. And my thought process, as, as I have um, in my past life, had some experience working in the accreditation um, process and starting the process when I worked in Wayland, that uh, some of this initial uh, review can be done with, without actually signing on to the program. Um, and we can start to look at some things um, because there can potentially be some costly items, uh, you know, especially if there's issues with the facility and things that need to be changed. Um, I think when you when you look at it, relatively speaking, um, we are in a modern facility and shouldn't run into too many major problems. Um, you know, and our equipment is relatively up to date, so we shouldn't run into a problem there either. Um, but we can start to look at that uh, before we um, actually officially sign on to the program and begin the process uh, in that way. Um, also, in the last few weeks, um, I've started working with C3 Industries, the dispensary that will be uh, is planning to go onto Banner Road. Um, part of the process is they need to go and under, undergo a security review um, with the local police department. Um, so I've been working with uh, Ankur on that. Um, I, I, I don't expect it to be a very difficult process, um, just in, our, in my beginning interactions with him and the information he's provided me. Um, you know, they're very experienced in this with the uh, the five dispensaries that they've already opened in Michigan. And I think we're gonna be able to work through this process um, as the rest of the permitting process works uh, works through the town. Um, and lastly, um, I forgot to include it on here, um, another relatively quiet month for animal control. Um, we did actually have a dog bite last week and I'm, uh, I'm waiting to follow up with Helen. I'd actually uh, placed a call to her today and haven't heard back um, just to find out where we stand with that. Um, it's not something we see very often, but uh, just something we need to stay on top of and make sure all the reports were filed properly. Um, you know, sometimes uh, those dog bites and things like that, if the dogs identified, do result in a quarantine uh, for the animal. So I just uh, am following up with her to see where we stand on that. So with the accreditation, Tom, yes, um, is there a process to go through the policies and procedures that you have and to yeah, update so them? Yeah, so the, um, they actually, there's actually a, a manual um, for, yep. uh, with standards that the policies need to meet. And mm -hmm. what's nice is the, the Accreditation Commission has a series of, of training programs um, for, to establish an accreditation manager, and then to show you the, the ways to go through and then document um, what's in your policies and what's needed and what needs to change. Um, so I started with the first class um, for myself, just as kind of a, uh, a reintroduction to the process. And uh, one thing that we'll have to do is, and it probably should be someone other than myself to actually be the accreditation manager. Um, and then we'll work together through, through the process. Um, so we're gonna, we'll look at that as we continue to move forward. Um, but for the, that initial certification, there's a 159 standards we have to meet. They're not mm -hmm. all policy. Some of it has to do with just, you know, annual fire inspections, say in the, uh, in the cell block and things like that. Um, but a lot of it is policy related. And I, I think what we're gonna find is, is most of it, our policies already meet those standards. Um, what we're gonna have to look at is um, the standards are in process of changing right now, going from the fifth edition to the sixth edition. And also with um, the recently passed police reform bill, 
um, there are going to be some mandated policy changes. Um, so it's actually probably a good time with those policy changes that are going to be required that we kind of work that in as part of the, uh, the process. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Tom? I have five, but I'll let Scott go first. Uh, the, the money to help get us to accreditation. <clears throat> There's, is there money in the fiscal year 21 budget for this? Um, not specifically. Um, and I think that I think FY 21 would be kind of the start of the process, um, looking at looking and making some of the changes that we can do without actually paying for it. And, and then, um, if it became, if we looked at it and we foresaw that it, it was advantageous to, to move into it in FY 21, um, I think we could probably move some things around and make it happen. Um, and there's also, and I have to check on it. Um, I believe it's 50% or close to 50% reimbursement that would actually come from Maya as well. Um, and, and, that, and they may actually even offer um, full full cost coverage in the first couple of years. Um, I said the way back when, 10 plus years ago, when I started a whale and my actually covered the first two years completely. And then fiscal year 22, have you put money for this in the budget? So for as we move forward, so when for the uh, next, not next year, I didn't put it in for next year's budget. Um, my thought was that FY23 is when we would start paying for it as we move forward. Okay. Peg? Um, so Tom, you hit on a couple of the questions that I already had. So animal control, I know it's something that we've talked about every time you've been here for the past several months. Uh, the written reports from Helen, I know that she doesn't have access to a computer, but uh, handwritten reports, I mean, anything that we can get from her that was part of her job description was to provide those monthly reports. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't get those um, after we talked on the last meeting, and that's one of the, another reason why I had reached out to her today. We haven't, um, we didn't connect, um, so I got to get her to come in and drop those off to me, and then I can scan them and uh, and email them to you to, so you can see them. Okay. Chief, I, if you could, I'd like to see the report on the dog bite, please. Make sure that it, to, you know, just to make sure that everything has been followed up on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then Tom, you started, you said uh, the beginning waiting for final paperwork uh, for body camera grant. Is that yeah. the 17,000 or have you found more? Yeah, no, that's the 17,000. And I think, um, I know Meg's going to come in later on and talk, um, but I think um, I've actually found a vendor um, with a product that, that works very well and they're willing to work within our parameters. So, so any idea of a time frame ish when those could be purchased and on the street? Um, I would give it probably roughly three months or so in terms of finalizing the grant paperwork, um, looking at getting an order done, getting them in, um, getting a policy in place, and uh, and getting people trained and up to speed on. Okay. And then, uh, oh, uh, go ahead, Scott. Just on those cameras, uh, I think there should be a connection to the Capital Planning Committee to make sure the replacement of them whenever their useful life is up is on the, the capital plan budget, because I assume this is not something we're going to do once and then stop. And since the grant was smaller, are we expecting at some point the town is going to buy more of these? Um, actually, with the vendor that I've found and the, and the product they have, um, we're, we're going to be only be getting a few less than I'd initially planned on. And I, I think uh, it's, it's going to work fine. Um, so I don't think that we're going to need to buy more and, unless unless for some unforeseen circumstance, we think we need to, you know, or we learn that we need to buy them for each individual officer, um, you know, that we're able to get enough for each full-time officer to be assigned one on their own and then have a, a pool of spares for part-timers. Um, could you give us an update on what's going on with the two new hires from a couple months ago, Molly and... So Dylan is, uh, is Dylan. working, he's in field training. Um, okay. So he's... Um, well, close to this is his third third week of field training now. Um, fourth week, he's Dylan is doing very well. Um, Molly has had her physical. I actually finally got the uh, the results of that uh, today and signed her up for the physical agility test, which is the next step in getting her signed up for the police academy. So uh, tentatively, she will be doing. Uh, they offer the physical agility test. They do a preview day, which is like a practice day, um, where they bring you into the facility. They let you run through the obstacle course. Um, so that would be on the 12th, and then uh, she would actually be completing the test on the 15th. Once that is done, um, at that point, I would actually be able to enroll her in a police academy. Nice. So, yeah, as it stands right now, 
Um, Randolph is very close to full at the end of February, and there's still uh, quite a few slots available for the early April Academy of Boys. Good, 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 good. Through the chair, um, I'm working on the offer letter for Molly now. Uh, Dylan's was done quite a while ago, but I'm working on the offer letter for Molly now um, and the agreement with respect to the Academy. Excellent. Okay, good. Um, my favorite topic, Tom. Woo -woo. Train trash yeah, pickup. In, in terms of trash from the construction project, I, I believe they're done. Um, I think the actual, the, th the other items that they still have out there, yep. I don't know what their plans are for those. Those are items that have been there for quite a long years. time. Um, yeah. <laughs> years. So yeah. I, uh, that I don't have an answer on. And um, I don't, my, my contact in my last discussion with him when I talked to Fitzy, um, I don't think he really knows what their plan is for them. Um, it's nice if we could stick a free sign on all those railroad ties and people could come and take them and use them in their gardens. Well, I guess my concern, I mean, are they, are they ever at any point considered hazardous waste? Because aren't they soaked with what? Creosine or, or whatever it is, Creosote. so they don't? Yeah. So yeah. are they a hazardous waste to sit and just get rained on, snowed on, and seep into the ground? Um, I, I guess my answer would be I don't know. That's kind of no. outside of my purview but I don't see it as much being very different than them laying along the grounds with the steel tracks on top of them and then the, the telephone yeah. poles in the, in the side of the road. All right. Well, if anyone's looking for metal, but I didn't say that. All right. And then uh, <laughs> my, well, you'd have to have a really long truck though to pick up those tracks. Um, it'd be kind or of hard torch. to run down the road with them. Um, uh, I know that you and Margaret were working with the phones at the transfer station. Do you have any update on that? Um, so th that's something that the, um, I worked with the Board of Health on. Um, I actually, a product came in today, a kind of a, a docking station for that. Um, and, you know, in talking to Paul, um, Paul and I have been working on that. I, I don't really know what the problem is. Um, mm -hmm. I was there today with my phone on the same network and it works fine. So um, what I'm doing is I have a, uh, I'm going to transition it from the phone that it's on onto a smartphone now that I have the dock that will sit on the desk there okay. and, uh, and see if that works. Um, you know, I, my plan actually was to talk to Paul tomorrow and I need to get the other phone back uh, to transition the, the data out of it in the SIM card and, uh, and put it onto the, a smartphone that I have. Um, Is there so, a huge cost difference between a cell phone and a regular landline? Well, so the, the landline that was there was part of a larger system that came into the town. So mm -hmm. there was one bill that were paid. I, I don't know what it would be to sign up to get another landline. You know, we moved right. all of the other town phones to an IP based phone system um, several years ago. And we had a few hanging out there and, and we're still paying a, a bill to Verizon. So just last, last week, um, we transitioned our fax machines to an e-fax service. So now um, those were the last numbers to come off that bill and that, that service will be canceled. Um, I know that the Board of Health had uh, done some exploration on their part in bringing the internet into the transfer station for a number of reasons that, that they were looking at. Um, and I, I believe it was cost prohibitive, which would allow us to, to add a phone to our current system. Um, but in, in terms of putting a new service down there and an individual service, I don't know what that would be. Okay. No, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I just know that there's, you know, you know, knock wood, there hasn't been anything that's ever gone on down there that would require, oh my God. And everyone usually has a phone in their pocket, but it will be that one time that everyone left the phone at home, it's dead. Uh, you know, the phone isn't working in the little uh, building and we need it. So, okay. All right. Those are my five. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate okay. it. Yep. No, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, Tom. No Thanks, problem. Tom. And I think I and done in time to uh, for uh, for our new uh, rep and senator, right? Excellent. I know. Just about <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Do we want to promote um, the senator elect John Cronin, or mm -hmm. are they in the audience? Yeah. Okay. I am. How's everybody doing this evening? Good. Doing well. Hi, John. Thank you for coming. Hi, John. Excellent. I just want to thank you uh, for having me today and just um, really want to take the opportunity to do nothing more than uh, than introduce myself. I know some of you I've met. Um, Chief Galvin, I think I met you at 19 Carter uh, 12 years ago prior to COVID. <laughs> it was a while ago, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in a different lifetime. And um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, Selectman Hawkins, I think I met you at uh, maybe a caucus again, 10 mm -hmm. years ago, pre COVID yep. in the world. Um, the rest of you, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to know um, and, and being your partner. I think in terms of legislative priorities, uh, the next year is going to look a lot like the last year in terms of COVID is really going to be front and center. There's no more important thing than we need to do than identify and address unmet needs. And I really look forward to uh, having a staff that's responsive to the needs in Berlin uh, and, and being your partner as we kind of work through what's going to be a, a period in time where I think it's safe to say things are going to get better before they get worse. Uh, the light is at the end of the tunnel, but I think it's going to require diligent leadership to get there responsibly um, and, and take care of our community. So I look forward to joining you in that effort. Um, in terms of legislation, I plan to file in the next session. Um, if any of you followed my campaign, we talked a lot about bills that are going to look at mental health parity, um, take a hard look at vocational tech admission standards. Uh, and, and also one thing I think we're going to try to do is uh, build a coalition to try to get a veterans court um, and other diversion programs in our criminal justice system here in Worcester County, which I, which I think um, we'll be able to do. Um, and I'd like to leave you with two things, really. Uh, I come here um, really excited about the team that um, won the delegation in North Central Massachusetts is, is kind of shaping up to be. I'm really excited to work with all of you, but I think especially uh, Representative Alec Kilcoin um, is, is really gonna hit the ground running and is gonna um, be a, a really good partner with my office. And, and I've also hired a great staff. so. Um, joining us tonight, and I, I don't think you can see them on the screen, but is my chief of staff, Kevin Bow, and Hi, Kevin. Uh, my... <laughs> we've we've talked. <laughs> okay, you talked. All right, good. Um, and my district director, Susan Templeton, who um, currently serves as a staff director for Harold Naughton. Um, and so I'm I'm really excited about the team we've assembled. Where uh, we're ready to go to work, and with that, I'll, I'll open it up for any questions you might have. Um, but again, I want to thank you for the privilege of, uh, of coming and introducing myself here tonight. Well, I believe Margaret must have forwarded you the last um, email that we had sent to Senator Tran and to uh, Harold Lawton. Um, and some of the things that they had said they were going to file or, or work on for us. So I, I can't say that I've seen that email specifically. I have been briefed by my chief of staff on um, the earmark for $100,000 um, for the, the tennis court um, renovation that, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but is currently in, a, in the 2020 bond bill? Uh, That's yeah. correct. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, that, that's something I, I plan on following up with as soon as I'm, I'm in the chamber. I, we, we get inaugurated on January 6th. Um, are, are there any other projects that, that you believe I, uh, I, I should be paying close attention to at this point in time? Um, we could probably put together a list of uh, several projects, but I mean, I just, I'll mention a couple. Um, we have um, a, a um, house called the Bullard House, which is in need of um, like a historical renovation. Um, they, the Historical Commission is intending to use it as a historical museum. Um, we also have a um, new town barn that we built, but unfortunately in order to get it passed, we did not include the solar, which it was intended to have. And then we have a property called the um, Tolman property, which um, deserves a, a real cleanup. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to mention anything more than that, Peg or Scott. I'll let Scott go first. No, go ahead. Um, so Senator Lick Cronin, I know that we haven't had the opportunity to, to chat, but I'm wondering how you and your staff will get to know the needs of Berlin and go beyond, hey, we're gonna have office hours, you know, you come to us and talk to us, but more so I wanna reverse that. I want you and your, and I'm gonna ask uh, Representative Kilcoyne the same thing. You know, I want you to come to us. So what is your plan to get to know the needs of the town, the residents in the town, you know, you've got 
folks that have been here for 4,000 years, you've got families, you've got you know elderly, you've got an awesome mix of people in the town that all will tell you 15 different things that they need. So what's your plan to um, really touch our community to understand what it is that we need to, uh, that we need help from you on? Yeah, I, I think there's no silver bullet, right? I think it's being visible. I think it's really um, working hard. And I think it's it's being in the community. There's no substitute for um, talking to 15 different people and getting 15 different opinions, but also developing working relationships with the, the people who are doing the work in town. Um, it's relationships with uh, the board here, with the different school committees that represent the schools um, uh, your kids are going to. Uh, those are key relationships that I, I plan on spending a lot of time developing. And the same goes with, um, with Chief Galvin um, and other public safety uh, people in town. And um, it was easier to do, right? I met Chief Galvin, I think in, uh, in February at 19 Carter. It was easier to do in a different world. Um, but I can tell you um, what I learned in the army and what I think I take with me is where you are is who you are, right? And I, I intend to be on the ground as much as possible um, in developing relationships with the people who are, are doing the work on the ground. And so I, uh, I, there's no secret formula, but it's spending time with, um, with the people uh, who I need to talk to to understand the priorities um, and the unmet needs in your community. So um, Senator Tran and Representative Naughton were very good about pushing out, and actually Representative Trahan as well, pushing out monthly updates about what they're doing and how to contact them. I'm going to assume that your office will do the same because what I was doing was taking those uh, emails that I would receive and then pushing them out to the town so that uh, the town knew what was going. So can we assume we'll have the same from you? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of um, legislation that's, that's in Beacon Hill, and uh, you know what you can count on my office for is a monthly newsletter um, with all official business, um, unaffiliated with our, our campaign or, or anything like that. Uh, but it'll detail the work we're doing in towns, um, how we're spending our time, legislation we're filing, and, um, and also give people notice of when and where we're gonna be in the community in the, in the coming month. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. You bet. Any other questions? May I interject? <laughs> May I ask one or make a comment? Yeah. Um, I um, I want to. I just want to express my appreciation uh, to you, uh, to Kevin. He and I have talked, and I plan on on continuing uh, regular communications with him. And I'm very very happy that Susan Templeton has stayed with you because that means consistency uh, for Berlin. And that's, um, and, and that's really important to the town. Um, I also wanna add um, something else um, with respect to traffic concerns in town. I had a, I had a discussion with Kevin about this. Um, with the development of the commercial uh, enterprises on the boundaries, or around the boundaries um, of the town um, and the new river bridge development um, and just generally uh, cars cutting through to avoid other, uh, congested areas, we are dealing with significant um, uh, traffic increases. So um, especially, well, especially we just recently had a uh, shared streets and spaces pilot program, but a non-controversial um, um, kind of common comment that came out of that was the fact that we're dealing with really serious traffic issues in town. Um, and so our traffic adv uh, safety advisory committee um, is going to be meeting and we'd like to try to schedule something in the not too distant future where our legislators, um, you'll, be in, you'll be in place by then, um, where our legislators, representatives from MassDOT and representatives from the town can all get together and talk about solutions. Um, to some of these problems that we're experiencing in town. So um, Kevin and I had a talk about that and we're happy to, to keep you posted as we hear more um, uh, on our end. Uh, MassDOT is going to have to be a key participant in all of this, um, given that Route 62 is one of the main areas of concern. Absolutely, great. Yeah, and I, I look forward to, uh, to diving into that issue with you and, and my team. Okay, great. Great. Hi Meg. Hi. Hi Meg. 
<laughs> Hope I got the time right. I tried to time it for 7.30 and then I was having some connectivity issues. So, uh, but I'm really happy to be here tonight. Well. Fellow guys, um, two days before uh, we were both sworn in. So this is the perfect way to kick things off. Um, I don't know if you guys, I, I don't know if you wanted me to start by saying a few words or just kind of go right into a back and forth. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Meg Kilcoin. I am representative elect for the 12th Worcester District. Um, I have the fortune of working with many of you guys already um, as I've spent the last 10 years working for state representative Harold Naughton as his legislative director. Um, he is is closing out his his final term in uh, the next two days. Uh, so I am actually continuing to work as his legislative director in that time. So, um, you know, it's sure. it's been quite a, it'll be quite hopefully a seamless transition once we hit Wednesday. But um, I was, uh, you know, so honored to be elected this past November to to uh, follow in his footsteps and, and be the representative for this district. Um, it's you know, this is certainly an interesting time, I think, for any of us to enter into politics, as you, I'm sure, are all aware, working in town government, we're dealing with an unprecedented crisis um, that is, con frankly, continuing. Um, I, you know, I feel very much more hopeful than I probably could say during the campaign, as we're continuing to see the vaccine rollout. Um, but we're going to have to monitor that quite carefully uh, going forward. In fact, just last week, um, I was helping Representative Naughton uh, try to bring some more clarity and information on uh, the vaccine rollout for first responders, uh, both in across the Commonwealth. So that includes fire department, law enforcement. Um, we just didn't have information as to when or how they were going to be administered. I'm happy to report that um, thanks to Representative Naughton's efforts and the support of over 80 legislators that the, gov the administration has released more information and details and we should start to see vaccines be administered to uh, local departments next week, which I think is great. Um, so, so hopefully that'll continue, but this is such a big issue that's affecting both state and federal government that um, you know, I'm excited to dive right into it and continue working with uh, Senator-elect Cronin, soon to be Senator Cronin, um, to make sure that you know, mm -hmm. we're continuing having this dialogue and communication. I mean, the way that we're going to know what's going on on the ground is hearing from you guys, um, you know, like you were saying earlier, Margaret, that traffic issue. Um, I, I'm so excited to to begin working on that with you guys as well. Um, I, I think, you know, there, we'll have to see, you know, specifically what solutions are needed. But I know in the past, we've absolutely been able to make progress throughout the towns on, on things like that. And I think it's something that actually is impacting Berlin and other towns in our district. I heard that a lot throughout the campaign trail, um, you know, We've seen a lot of development in our region, which is a good thing, but that can have the impact of things like increased traffic, of reduced pedestrian walkways, of creating safety hazards. So it's something that we absolutely have to keep in mind um, to just make sure that people are still having able to enjoy the same quality of life they always have um, while managing and balancing development can, you know, needs and concerns. And I apologize, I'm rambling. I haven't had to do these speeches in a while, but <laughs> bottom line, you know, this is, um, I, I've spent the last 10 years working on these issues, working for these towns and these communities. So I'm really excited to, uh, you know, step into that role and, and hopefully learn the tools and skills that I have um, to make sure that we're really having a seamless transition of strong representation for our region. Um, you know, we're expecting uh, the budget cycle to continue on the more traditional path. So um, as far as I know, we can anticipate, as many of you might know that we uh, saw this last budget got delayed. So the final budget was actually passed in November. We're expecting that to go back on sort of the normal cycle. So the, seeing the governor release his budget in January, getting an idea of where we stand on chapter 70 funding um, and local funding. And the house is expected to be taking up that budget process late March and April. So, you know, I, I think we absolutely, you know, what I would ask of you guys, you know, keep us abreast of what funding needs are, if there's any deficiencies um, that we can address. You know, I know Representative Naughton has been really successful in, in bringing back vital funds to the district for not just, you know, education, but, but various projects that we need. And so I think that's a conversation I absolutely want to keep having and it's always worth trying. So, I mean, like, for instance, safety issues, if we can get funding for, you know, a crosswalk or a sidewalk or a stoplight any of those things that that's an opportunity there that we might have to try to help support the town's needs. Now, we still don't know what revenue projections are going to be for FY23. 
sorry, I'm trying I had to do the math in my head for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but I think that what I would want you all to know, um, now that we're past the campaign cycle, without we're getting into this work, communication is, is key. And I think some of you have my cell phone number already. If you don't, I will absolutely put it in that chat. Um, and, and just always feel free to call me. Um, I just noticed police chief Galvin down there on the call as well. <laughs> Good to see you again, chief. Um, you too. <laughs> um, so yeah, anything that you know I should be aware of, or Senator John uh, Cronin should be aware of, that's that's kind of what it all is, what it's all about. I mean, just to give you some insight with the vaccine issue I worked on last week, that was something that a firefighter in the district called our attention to, and it kind of just snowballed from there. And it, we found out it was an issue facing uh, dozens, if not half, the municipalities in the Commonwealth. And so it turned out that this one issue that was raised ended up being enough to kind of generate, you know, enough pr- pressure to really get results. And, and so you just, we have to be focused on what our local needs are, but sometimes those local needs translate into statewide issues that can help a lot of people. So, um, you know, it's, we're going to be inter- entering an interesting time, a new session, uh, and it's going to, you know, we're not going to really be able to take our, our foot off the gas, so to speak. So I'm just excited to be here talk to you guys about, you know, questions you have. And um, I probably have already talked too much, so I apologize. (laughs) Um, But um, I did want to make one quick note. Um, I know Representative Naughton was here a couple weeks ago before Christmas, I think, to give you guys an update um, on two of the local bills that are currently we're trying to get through. Uh, I don't, neither of those bills have moved past where he last, uh, I think, updated you. Um, The H5207, which is the bill the Governor Baker has filed for, I believe the fire chief, is is still in committee. It just had a hearing right before the new year. So um, we'll be trying to get, see if we can get sort of any last minute movement on that. If not, um, we'll be sure to make the, myself and, uh, you know, the Senate to make sure that we get Governor Baker to refile that come the new year and and hopefully fast track it along. Um, And then H39, 35, which let me just check my notes quickly, um, was the, uh, the, I'm sorry, I, I think I might have missed, oh, I'm sorry, no, this is an act validating actions taking at the annual town meeting, um, and that one is actually in, in Senate third reading, which was, I believe, the, the update that Representative Naughton gave you, so we're going to continue, Representative Naughton is going to continue to push for those, we're going to see a lot of movement in the next 48 hours, and um, if need be, uh, you know, we're going to put those right back on on track to hopefully get a swift passage. So, um, and I'll continue, Margaret, updating you if there's any movement in those at the staff level. And, and then if not, or if they're still, if they're not quite through the finish line, we'll go from there and, um, you know, make sure that we try to get those done as quickly as possible. So I'm, I'm hearing that we um, uh, should be expecting uh, or should should have good communication between both uh, the board and the town and our representative and Senate representative. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yes. And, and just, I think I, I don't know if you guys, if, if this has been, if I've told you yet, but, um, I will be hiring as my aide, Josh Duhamel, who works on representative not staff currently as his constituent director. Um, so he might have you might have had the uh, pleasure of working him with him before, but he's a really hard worker. He he does a lot of our constituent work, so I'm really excited to have his experience um, and work and you know him be on my team. And and so uh, to have him there is going to be again great continuity. Um, and again, I think that's going to facilitate even better communication with myself and Senator Elect Cronin's office. So uh, you know we'll hopefully be able to have a pretty uh, small learning curve <laughs> when come <laughs> jet, come Wednesday when we get sworn in, so. Yeah, that's good. Great. One of the um, items, Megan and John, you had tapped on it earlier where you talked about mental health. Um, I had received an email from a parent in town that is trying desperately to figure out what to do for the middle schoolers, um, that her specific quote was, uh, her six-year-old child doesn't understand COVID, he understands what Plato is and you know there's uh you know a lot of concern that the the middle graders are kind of getting left behind as to what to do and i know with covid that there really isn't a lot to do 
So, you know, somewhere in the back of your minds, obviously don't need an answer tonight is, you know, what can we do, you know, as a state, as a community to take care of, uh, you know, of those little kids who don't understand that they can't see their friends, they can't, you know, go hug their grandparents, they can't go out and play, it's just too stinking cold to go out and play um, yeah. outside, but, um, you know, very concerned about the, the mental health of the younger generation, you know, older Older people like us, we figure out a way and we get by, you know, we work, we take care of our families, but little kids, they don't, you know, they're kind of stuck. They're, they're the forgotten population. So if there's anything that, you know, you could do that we can think of, um, you know, to help this population would be more than appreciated. I would say, um, keep telling us, sharing these stories with both myself and the Senator, because, yeah. you know, we're, I think the last year we just were trying to focus on just surviving, right? Like yeah. just getting funding, making sure, I mean, there were fears we we're going to have to cut funding and, and making sure. sure we were kind of keeping that level and, and that's important. And, and I'm, you know, that's something we had to do, but we're, I think we're, we're hopefully going to start turning a corner here and we have to make sure that these kids aren't being left behind. Uh, my sister is a kindergarten teacher for Worcester public schools actually. And she is all remote and has been um, for uh, since April, since March and it's I, I've seen how she she's teaching six-year-old kids and and yeah. sometimes some of them are in daycare and they just have one teacher watching them and, and sometimes they'll just log off and, and there's nothing she can do or yeah. you know these kids aren't getting the same social interaction they need so I, I'm hoping that there's going to be or if not you know we'll start the conversation of what we're going to do right. to give kids support even when we're back in school because these are as you said, uh, Peg, these are kids that are missing a year, especially younger kids, yeah. really important developmental years. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I think we're going to see teachers are slated to be in one of the priority phases for vaccines. And so hopefully that might mean that we'll be able to see at the very least an increased hybrid model for mm -hmm. school districts. That's obviously going to be a decision between the districts and, and DESE. Um, but I think we absolutely, to your point, need to make sure that we're not neglecting to just get back to normal. Um, we're going to have to do some additional work here to to try to 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 miss catch up for this lost time that we have. Yeah. So I think what's helpful for us, you know, hearing stories like that, um, you know, obviously protecting confidentiality, or even if the people want to come to us directly, um, that helps us. We can give that to, you know, the chair of education, to the chair of children and families and, and okay. say like, hey, this is this is important to our people of our constitu constituents. And and that helps send that signal that, okay. you know, this is a priority for everybody. So yeah. that would yeah, be Yeah, no, Meg, I will. I'll, I'll scratch out all the the parents' names and things like that. And you you can see the line. And that that just broke my heart. He doesn't understand COVID. He understands Play-Doh. Yeah. <laughs> how do you respond you know and, and as an official of the town you're like I, I don't know what to do you know Margaret help me I don't know what to do and Margaret's like well you know I'll try help me I don't know what to do so it's a vicious circle just say, we're stuck in when we talk about mental health broadly so much of our system is is reactive right um we have so many of our resources aligned after somebody's in a, a mental health crisis and usually the point of entry is you know in the back of um, a police cruiser um, on the way to an emergency room. And I think broadly as a society, we need to take a more holistic view of mental health. And I, I had a conversation with the superintendent of schools in Lunenburg today. Um, in that school system, they don't have a behavioral, a behavioral health um, treatment specialist or mental health counselor. They have one social worker that covers um, the entire school district. And so I think as a society and as a commonwealth, and, and this is something I hope to work with, with Representative Alec Kilcoyne on, but um, we need to shift how we view mental health treatment to a reactive system, to a, pre a preventive system. And, you know, to, to put a finger on, on your point, Peg, I think they're a really good place to start is making sure we have adequate resources for behavioral health treatment in our school system and, and identifying kids who are at risk, um, uh, or as we say in the army, get left a bang. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and again, I know there's no easy answer and I know that there's no quick answer, but probably the more of us that try to attack it from different angles, we're going to figure out something, um, you know, not only to help the, the kids in Berlin, but to help all the surrounding towns as well. I would imagine that there's going to be a lot of needs yeah. uh, for students in the next few years because mm -hmm. of all the virtual learning and things that you know you don't catch when you're not there um, in person. So uh, yeah, 
we need, we need support for our students. Yeah. And, and teachers too, I think. I know teachers yeah. have been struggling a lot with this burden and we've asked a lot of our of parents, of students, of teachers over the last few months and they've Absolutely. risen to the challenge and, you know, we got to be there to once we can. Yeah, exactly. So. Thank you. Look forward to working with you both. Yes. yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Nice oh yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Nice um, and like I said, uh, Margaret, I can send you my contact information. Um, we should be getting our official state house stuff soon, and we'll make sure that is distributed to all of you guys. Um, and so just, just reach out anytime. Uh, and thank you for having me. Will do. Great. Thanks, Meg. Thank Have a good you. night. Thanks, guys. You too. Happy New Year. I think it might be a good idea to um, put together some of the important things yeah. in writing and um, send it on. Mm -hmm. to um, John Cronin and Meg Kilcoyne. Agreed. That's good, yeah. Okay. Shall we move on to our town administrator report? I always have to follow the tough acts, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Margaret, at least no one was, like, I know, but at least no one was like weepy eyed, uh, you know, last week with Dean and then the week before with Hank, so, you know. <laughs> all, right, right. <laughs> all right, well, I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, uh, Chris and, and Peg, I know you um, attended last week's uh, personnel committee meeting, the December 30th meeting. Um, where uh, Sandy, the HR consultant, prevented, uh, presented a, a final draft comp and class report um, that contained ex extensive data. Um, that it's a, it's a very long report. Um, I am gathering questions and comments from the personnel committee and I'd appreciate um, questions and comments from board members too. If, um, if you have time to look through that report and you have any questions or comments, please get them to me. Um, and then Sandy will be able to address them. Do you have a drop down oh, date, Margaret? Uh, these are my questions on that report. I already have a whole page for them, so I'll write them yeah, up. Yeah, you send them along. Send them along. We'll get them to Sandy. There, is it on? Is it in the Google Drive? It's a spreadsheet. Report? Come on. It's, it... I know. It's, it's right um, up your alley. I did not upload it. I emailed it. I so okay. I, I emailed it to you. All right. I'll have to look for it. Okay. Um. All right. Uh. The. Um, we, we received confirmation today that the um, Assabet Regional Housing Consortium is going to be meeting on uh, January 12th, um, and I asked that um, our board chair and uh, Tim Wheeler, who's been active for the planning board in these, in these uh, discussions, early discussions um, with Metro West, um, if they uh, could be allowed to attend, um, and they said yes, so um, I'm sending that link. This is gonna be the meeting where Berlin presents its, um, or the consortium takes up Berlin's petition to join the consortium. Um, once we hopefully get um, an affirmative on that and we're able to join effective FY22, we're gonna to have to start planning for, um, uh, for a budget for that assessment for the consortium to be able to, uh, to have those services provided. Um, the COVID-19, I'm sure you, everyone knows now that the, uh, the Federal CARES Act and Municipal Access to Coronavirus Relief Funds um, has been extended for another year to the end of December 2021. Um, but with the change in administration in Washington, change in Treasury Secretary, we do not know what the rules on coronavirus relief spending are going to be. Um, so I have advised that we pause on our spending um, unless it's essential um, um, PPE or disinfecting supplies until we receive further clarification and guidance on the federal rules governing use of those funds. Um, we don't wanna find ourselves in a situation where we're spending money thinking um, that the expenditures will comply with the rules when, you know, it, it, when in fact um, they may not. So we are going to just pause briefly, let the administration get in and let the treasury, um, let the treasury department provide uh, the rules on that spending. 
Um, I am going to be working with Cemetery Commissioner Barry Yeager on a uh, request for quotes for cemetery maintenance contractor. Um, this will be a short term, um, a short term procurement through the remainder of FY21, so we can get through the spring of this year. And then responses to the RFU, uh, RFQ are going to determine um, what the select boards of the town's uh, next actions may have to be on a vendor contract. Um, so the, the question will be whether um, the responses will require a, you know, disclosures to be filed and the board to accept those disclosures and things of that nature. So I'll be working with Barry on that starting this week. The um, Peg just brought up the um, the, um, the issue or the concern that she received from a Berlin resident regarding um, uh, children uh, during COVID and concerns with children during COVID. Um, this actually triggered um, uh, something that we do need to do um, with our school district, and that is execute a lease agreement. A lease agreement is referred to in the school district agreement. Um, but a lease has not been executed. It wasn't executed um, when the agreement was um, was approved. Uh, the regional agreement was approved by the member town. So that's something that we really should be working on um, and look to finish before the end of this fiscal year because there are going to be long-term implications um, with respect to capital projects at the school and, and things like that. So that's something that we need to work on this spring. Um, and that's... That's about it for now. Okay, questions or comments for Margaret? Two? I have two. All right. Um, and Margaret, it's kind of sort of in your response, maybe. Um, the CENIs, where are we with the money that was owed to the town in November? Have they ever responded back with how they're going to uh, pay that money that is owed to the town? So it's in, um, I did include it here. They are expected to respond this week. They asked to respond the week of January 4th. So we are expecting a response from them this week as to um, what kind of payment plan we um, we should expect. Okay. And then it's probably more so a question for uh, Dennis when he comes, you know, galloping around on his loop to the to the board. Uh, do we have any updates on all the taxes that are back owed to the town, whether it be people or commercial, uh, where we are with that, if that number has decreased from when it was first presented to us? Um, yes, there have been a couple of payments that have been made since Dennis presented. Um, there was one, uh, the there is still one outstanding. Um, it's a large commercial tax payment and that, that has not been paid. And it's, um, it's actually the hotel, it's Homewood Suites um, that is still outstanding. But we have received uh, the larger payments uh, from Solomon Pond uh, Mall or from the businesses at Solomon Pond Mall and from the large um, establishments at Highland Commons. So um, that said, um, Solomon Pond Mall um, still has an obligation under their development agreement to provide funding for open space annually. I think that's really, really um, winding down now. I don't know if we're on the last payment or the last um, one of two payments, um, but that actually, um, that actually is late. That's a $50,000 payment to the town um, that was due. A reminder has been sent, um, but the town has not received that payment yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, there's not a lot to say. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, I mean, you can't get blood from a stone, you know, uh, you understand that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the mall, if you've been over there lately, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like an echo chamber. Uh, you know, there's quite a few businesses that aren't there. And even if you go up to Highland, there's still a bunch of buildings that are empty too. So um, I'm sure Dennis has all this under control, I was just curious because his initial list was rather long of, um, you know, back owed um, taxes from folks in town or from businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll bug Dennis whenever he shows up um, at the next okay. meeting. Uh, and just so you're just so you're aware on the um, on that mitigation payment or the open space mitigation payment from Solomon Pond, that's not Dennis who's doing the invoicing. That's actually the accounting office who uh, <gasps> who's been doing that. So. June. Yeah, she, 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, look, and she's in the but audience we're doing too. Our I'm surprised that she's not that she just didn't like shut herself off. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. I'm done with Margaret questions. Okay, Scott, you okay? Yeah, I have some that I think are just better at the end of the meeting than at this point. Okay. Um, then we'll move on to old business. And I had asked Margaret to talk about her priorities, the board objectives with the TA priorities and objectives. Well, I didn't really know how else to how else to tackle this. So I added two worksheets to Peg's um, spread her spreads Peg's workbook. Um, and just showed asterisks where there, there is overlap. I guess what I could probably do is just, I, I don't know if you want me to list the items that are complete at this point, um, or just the items where there's overlap with the board's priorities and objectives. I, I have a list of about probably 15, um, 15 or about 15. Um, where the items have been completed on my list of priorities. Um, and then there are several others that I've noted, um, you know, I've taken different notes and obviously COVID, a year of COVID has um, delayed completion on some of these things, but we continue to work in the background um, on them. So uh, I make you feel yeah, I, I was go over the ones that you finished, but just well, so I mean, I was surprised how much we've managed to get done despite COVID, because there's a lot of places that, that really yeah. have done nothing but COVID for the last 10 months. Yeah. Um, I, feel like I, I am mo most interested in the ones that, like, you think are doable but stuck and problematic, where potentially some conversation at the select board level or even some work on, mm -hmm. on our parts could help unstick. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, let's see. Okay. I mean, a lot of them look like I, I was very impressed by how many both are done, but even those that aren't done or some of them are on glide paths. Yeah. You know, the yeah. library septic, you know, you were just waiting for the bids that are being opened that's been redone. And that's you know, a, the, yeah, that's redone. <laughs> right. The the benefits it's and fun. health insurance, you know, is a lot of stuff has been done on. There, um, you know, there's another major procurement coming up and that's the 23 Linden parking lot. And that's something that I have to get on very, very soon, because if we don't, we might, you know, we might run the risk of contractors booking other projects before they get to ours. And this is a project that we need to have done by the end of June. So I've been, you know, I've had ongoing concerns about tackling uh, that one. Um, I don't, really know how the board can help except maybe um, if we could plan some sort of um, community meeting maybe at the March uh, coffee talk we could talk to the public about their thoughts on the parking lot I mean we certainly want to try to have that two hundred thousand dollar project be a project that satisfies everyone um, and, and I'm going to be working on the procurement documents long before March, but, um, you know, the time crunch on that is a bit of a concern. It's the grant runs out at the end of June. Um, there have been no extensions granted. And so um, that's something that we need to tackle. So if you're looking for concern, that's one area of concern. That I have. So do you, will they really not extend the deadline? They will not. They have made it clear they will not, not extend the, okay. um, that was done through, um, through Housing Choice. It was a small uh, town capital project and they've made it clear they will not extend it. So that's something that we have. Yeah, to, then we need to get that done, right? Yes, we need to get that done um, in between, you know, in between the other things. Um, I, I don't know, maybe Scott, to your, to your question, um, uh, maybe I'd just ask the board, uh, you know, what priorities and objectives listed here, um, you know, can we accomplish more efficiently together than separately? Um, uh, although you haven't assigned to fire as much as you, you know, that the house numbering and visibility, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, us talking to our social circles, us talking to our neighbors, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, post some social media posts. I think this is a great time of year to really encourage everyone, you know, at 530 in the evening to go out to the street and how easy is it to see your house number through the snow and in the darkness. And if you can't quickly see your number, even knowing where it's at, is a great time to, to improve it, you know, make it bigger, make it brighter, make it a different color. 
So at both sides of the mailbox, because I've noticed on some houses in my walks, I see it quite clearly taking the dog away from the community. And then I come walking back and like, oh boy, there's no house number on this side. I would have gone past whatever the house number was. So yeah, so maybe just kind of a communications push on the house numbering. I mean, the last we had, um, you know, gone, we had discussed this. I know the fire department was looking at, um, and, and the highway were looking at kind of taking the lead. Um, on this type of thing, but maybe this really is a more a communication issue and getting people to recognize the importance of having, you know, large um, house numbers um, so public safety can find them. I mean, and I know that some people have complained that the large, you know, uh, bright colored numbers might look garish or ugly, but you know, it, it, if it if it makes a thirty second difference in the and the EMS getting to your house when you're having a stroke. That mm -hmm. can make the difference between something that is survivable without a permanent disability and having a permanent disability, you know. And so, it is definitely worth putting those large, bright numbers on both sides of your mailboxes and on your house and uh, mm -hmm. or, or condo or whatever uh, is going to be. It's just so important. And again, darkness is where you don't see it. And so, a great time when it's you don't have to stay up till nine thirty at night to see what it looks like in the dark uh, so is a good time to go and look at. Yeah, you can go in it. You can see it at five. <laughs> Four twenty-five is sunset. Yeah, I mean, I think yep. that um, uh, Ken and I don't know if it was Dave uh, Litchwell that, or yep. hmm, or Dave Smith. They were working on specifications. So you know, Scott, it's you know, uh, you know, a good point, Margaret. We can uh, go down your list of hey communication types where we're going to hit as many people in town. You know, Powderhouse mm -hmm. News. I know it was on the blinky sign. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that, and just start to, to push it, you know, because there's not yep. a lot that you can do if you can provide, hey, it needs to be X big by X big, uh, you know, posted, blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, it's a uh, individual responsibility. And I know that stuff has even been put out in the tax bills. So, mm -hmm. but I think that yep. we just keep hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, and <clears throat> 10 people do it, 20 people do it. How about the yeah. um, article that you're putting together for the Clinton item too? Yeah, yeah, we can put that in there, um, you know, for next month. Uh, yep. You know, I wanted to leave off like this year with like kind of like bright lights and yeah. all the fun stuff. Yeah. But yeah, no, definitely. That's a top one for yeah. for next year. Can I can they find your house in the dark? Yeah. Yep. So, OK, so Margaret, we can kind of roll. I think between Scott and I and, and Chris, we can figure out a plan and, and kind of take that one off your plate. That would be great. Um, and I. I'm sure I'm sure the fire chief can get his hands mm -hmm. on some sort of, of and Dave. You know, communication yeah. materials for yep. the street numbering. And then okay. our plan for reworking of the goals um, and objectives, both for the town administrator and the select board, because um, uh, I, I wonder if are these synced up sort of time wise for renewal, like the the next select board election is in in May, the fiscal year starts July, uh, whether or not, again, that sort of June timeframe is a good time to both for the town administrator and the select board to be setting our goals and objectives for that fiscal year, uh, doing it at about the same time uh, so that we're sort of on the same page. And in some respect, Margaret, your or the town administrator's goals and objectives being one of those things that helps orientate a new uh, or even existing uh, select board members to to where you see some of the priorities are i think would be just a a good cyclical thing to get ourselves in the in the habit of doing i think that's a wonderful idea <laughs> um you know I, i'm you know timeline that's you know the board can certainly determine that this past year we um it was in february um that the ta's priorities and objectives um were um were approved i'm I'm happy to to uh, my my um, my desire would be that we we align them at the same time rather than at different times. It just would it would make it flow. I think a little easier. Yep. Less likely for conflict where you think you know well, your number. I don't think there's going to be conflict. I think it's just. I know. I, mean, I, I can't imagine we're like, yeah, uh, we're like, we're saying we should widen these three streets and yours says, no, we should narrow these three streets or something. But, but see, uh, I see my, I see my responsibilities as carrying out your objectives too, operationally, right, right. you know, and so uh, we, we 
do need that alignment. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if you want to go over any of these at all, Margaret, or no? Um, probably uh, if you if you want me just to talk about the ones that um, that I've that I kind of noted some overlap. Uh -huh. um, first of all, Riverbridge fiscal impact uh -huh. studies, Riverbridge development agreement review. Um, that's that is ongoing. In fact, um, I reached out to the the small working group we have that's been uh, reviewing the development agreement for. Um, a meeting in March, so we can start picking it apart uh, or continuing to pick it apart um, uh, to see if there's any areas that we might, the town might be interested mm -hmm. in modifications. Mm -hmm. um, then there was, um, let's see, um, ambulance billing. Um, the board had noted that on the goals and objectives, and that's something that's um, that's also ongoing. We do have an administrative team. The chief noted this. Um, uh, the accountant, uh, the chief, deputy chief, and I um, have been meeting. In fact, we have a meeting tomorrow um, on, on updates on that. So um, that's another item that's ongoing and overlaps with the boards. Um, the Tolman property brownfields assessment. So um, I am monitoring um, the CMRPC's work with DEP and EPA on the brownfields assessment and hopefully we are going to be moving on to a phase two scope. And I know Chris um, mentioned the, the cleanup needed and the board's goals address the tax taking status of that property and the, um, the Bonazzoli property as well. So um, there's going to be some overlap with that. Uh, my focus uh, primarily has been on how do we get a resolution on these properties so the town does not take um, hazardous properties. Uh, so we want to try to alleviate um, that liability to the greatest extent possible. Um, then there was the goal about the town-owned facilities management and use, um, the inventory. Um, that has been, I have not made much progress on this at all. And Scott, I know you are very interested in doing this, um, the inventory of town buildings. It's something that we absolutely need to do. Um, and we could take uh, a, a few different approaches um, on that. And I'd like to continue working on that. Um, with respect to town facilities condition, I think that it might be in our best interest to potentially look at um, grant funding or other funding to actually take a look at kind of a holistic assessment of town owned properties to see um, what their current condition is and what their needs are going to be moving forward. Um, the well, and I, actually... I, I think I think some of those lists, because we put together the list to look at some of the buildings, it, I think some of it is, which one of those do we not need anymore? Which mm -hmm. ones are sort of albatrosses That's that we should find a way to, to not try to do new roofs and new foundations and mm -hmm. new windows on, but, you know, uh, either A, sell off to somewhere else or help demo so it can become an open land for, for other uses. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that's going to be important to do um, along with the other um, the other items. Um, we had asked at one point, we asked mass development if that's something that they could do for us. At that point, they were not able to, but since we're doing, um, well, since we, the uh, CMRPC is doing the village center study, maybe there's some way that we can incorporate that into that particular study, at least for yeah. the buildings that are right in the village center. Um, the Maya risk management, um, we were, you know, my, my intent was to seek grants um, that addressed OSHA compliance related issues. We ended up being awarded a grant that did a roof inspection um, and will put roof guards on the town office building roof, but it's still, um, it still addresses the grant, um, the grant seeking um, and administration. Um, more buildings and facilities, deferred maintenance, uh, energy efficiency measures. Yes, we got the, um, and my priorities and objectives uh, noted highway barn. Um, and so we've at least gotten to a first step on that with the Meta Grant to look at the options for solar um, for that particular facility. 
Um, and then to a couple of other things, um, the committee handbook and thanks so much to um, the board for assisting with the, the development of the committee handbook. I will be wrapping that up this week, um, but that helps to address the priority on um, the priorities and objectives with respect to onboarding uh, new board and committee members. Um, and so I think that's gone a long way to doing that. Um, and then finally, the tax title properties that was um, that was something else. And I, what I addressed in my list here where there was overlap with the boards was maybe um, there is potential for MVP grant funding, especially on um, the dam, uh, that failing dam on one of the, um, on one of those tax taking properties. If there's a way that we could get funding to resolve that particular issue that would take away um, pretty much the main issue the town would have when it, if it has to take that property. So I think that, are there more? No, that last point ones. might be again, that, that last point about uh, repairs of the dam might be one of those to share with our new uh, representatives elect as they're looking at funding for the state because we can't be alone in towns that have old dams on tax title property that, that mm -hmm. are potential tax to be resolved mm -hmm. and what the state could do to help some of those out. Mm -hmm. Right. Good I do point. think it's important that we put together um, some kind of comprehensive list just to put it on their radar. No, that's a really good, Mary, is that something that you, through the chair, Mary, is that something you might be able to do? Just do um, an outline of all the issues that have been brought up tonight that the legislators um, should be notified of. If you could do like a summary of the items that were addressed tonight with the boards uh, in the board's discussion with the legislators. Yeah, I'll watch the tape back. Okay. Okay. And there's, I mean, and Mary, there's a bunch that I wrote down too. Is uh, when Chris was like, "Oh, and 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 and." So uh, if I could go back through my scribbling, I can uh, send those to you. But it was definitely the ones that I caught was like the bullet house, the town barn with the solar, the Tolman uh, cleanup. So uh, you know, I can go back if there's anything else that I could find to help you. Yeah, I I think those were the three that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, Mark, but just a, a quick question for you. I know that the energy folks, the two lovely gentlemen are kind of like up and running and there's a meeting coming up. But when you look at uh, my town government for Berlin and you look up boards and committees, uh, energy is not listed. So there's an email, there are emails actually going back and forth between the chair and Eloise I saw today. And so they're uh, hopefully working out uh, the details okay. on getting the posting to my town government. Cool. They're meeting next week, by the way. Yeah, um, the 12th, I think. Yeah, oh. and Kelly Brown, who uh -huh. is our Green Communities um, Regional Coordinator, will be attending that meeting. So pretty much if we kind of sort of, uh, sort of work on ours that overlap with yours, I mean, that will definitely, that I think will definitely help um, with that. Definitely. And I started an email while you were chatting just um, so that I can finish it after the meeting to go to um, Ken and all you guys um, and Dave Litchwell um, about numbering the houses you know, what do they have for specifications? So at least we can do that. And then I know that June is in the audience. She's like, oh my God, they mentioned my name. So June, maybe when you come to, for your more, bah, for your meeting, that you can talk to us a little bit more about the uh, ambulance collections and what you anticipate for uh, what we may need to write off and, and where we are just to um, get us up to date on that. Yeah, an update of some kind, huh? Yeah. I think that would be probably the, the biggest the fire one chief her. tends to update us fire chief tends to update us as well. Yeah, he, yeah. he wasn't we weren't able to get to that this yeah. week, but the intent for the chief is to come with a small um, a small amount of money that needs to be yeah. written off um, based on the old uh, the old uncollectibles. So it's all about cleaning it, cleaning up all of those. Right, which again will be an ongoing thing because we'll never do 100% yeah. collection. I mean, never. I think if we get 60 or 70%, we'll probably be in great shape. And so we're still going to always write up 25 That's to 30%, right. percent, I'm sure, every year. Right, right. Yeah. And there, there has to be a, an annual, um, at least an annual um, write-off um, by the board um, yep. for things moving forward. 
Yep. Well, the nice thing is that there's a process in place now and the people that need to be involved are involved, you know, whether it's Chief Clark, whether it's Sharon McGowan, you know, to help with all the reports from all the folks that go out and do that. And, you know, June keeps an eye on it and I'm sure that Amy's involved as well. So we've got a ton of eyes on it now more so uh, than I know since I've been around. So very appreciative of that. That's right. So do we want to do we want to move on or do we want to have more discussion? I think we're good. good. I th think as long as we can keep our goals going, the ones that, yep. that you and I and Scott came up with, Chris, and kind of keep them moving and then just keep blending them with Margaret, um, both lists are going to go away shortly and we can replace with um, new shiny ones. <laughs> I love new shiny things. Well, either that or either that or we could, um, you know, focus on what we have, even, even yeah. when we go to look at her goals, if it's in February or whenever, mm -hmm. I think we've got a, it's quite a list. I mean, Correct. it would be easier to uh, focus on, mm -hmm. you know, the most important ones yeah, rather agreed. than adding to it. Yep. I like the fact that I whittled mine down by 16 this Look year. Look at you. Just show off. I know it. <laughs> I know. And there's other ones that are heading out the door soon. So there you go. <laughs> you might want to list those ones that you um, accomplished in your TA report. So, because it goes online. Okay. Yeah. okay. If you can. If you can. <laughs> okay. If you have time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> it's a feel good um, thing. <laughs> It is. It is. And I think people would be surprised. Oh, oh, look, we've right. accomplished that. Yeah. More to come. <laughs> Margaret, I'll give you a special shout out next month in the item. So, uh, you know, we can pick off a few of them that, that mean most to the town and get them in there. Sure. So next month we can say that we've been admitted to the Assabet Regional Housing Consortium. Yes. Cross that off the list. That is right. correct. <laughs> that is correct. Okay. Well, why don't we move on to uh, the subject of the single use plastic bag ban. <laughs> okay, the board has talked about this the last couple of meetings and um, I believe that there was a consensus among the board members that in fairness um, to the businesses in town, especially in light of COVID, um, that there be some, some leniency and enforcement of the new bylaw. Um, so what I'm recommending tonight, um, just to make it formal. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is that the select board approve a one-time extension of the enforcement provisions of the bylaw to July 1, 2021. And um, this is going to give retailers um, sufficient time to actually prepare to com uh, comply with the bylaw requirements. And it's gonna give the board time to designate the appropriate enforcing authorities under the non-criminal disposition bylaw. So that is my recommendation tonight. Um. I would I would make that motion, but I would also encourage um, Margaret to write up that paragraph and send it over to the item mm -hmm. and our current list of places to post it because I think, you know, uh, again, it goes back to more publicity. We are doing things. I think it's the right thing. It's the right thing to have the ban. It's the right thing also to give businesses uh, some better time for enforcement. I, I, I think it's a decent feel-good story all the way around. Agreed. Oh, and if you're okay, looking for a second place, yeah, I got it. Look, look, February items. So there you go. It's there. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a second on Scott's motion, by the way. Okay. okay. Um, if there's no more comments or questions, then we'll take a vote. Um, Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. And it's unanimous. And um, we have benefits consulting. Yes, this is another thing that has been discussed um, at the board's meeting for the last few meetings. Um, when we look at the contract that was executed with our benefits consultant, there are a number of items that need to be accomplished. Um, there's a lot of investigation that needs to happen um, over the course of the next year. And um, including, but not limited to drafting a multi-year benefits strategy to achieve program improvements, evaluating cost impacts of potential plan design changes or, and or entry into various um, uh, qualified health insurance groups, um, avail evaluating different cost sharing alternatives that our current uh, provider, Maya or other qualified established groups could offer. 
Um, so there's, and, and in addition to that, um, it, I think it's extremely important in light of the contract that addresses um, the potential for retiree health benefits to have this actuarial baseline study done. Um, that's going to give us um, a number um, that shows the potential um, uh, OPEB liability of the town so that we can all be educated on what the potential uh, liability to the town is, uh, not just for one year, but over time. And so that the IAC and the board and town meeting, frankly, um, would be able to make informed decisions on, um, on any changes uh, moving forward. So I think that we need to be armed um, with, um, with information um, in order to proceed. So therefore, I recommend um, that rather than proceeding according to the July 1, 2021 implementation timeline on that statute acceptance, that the town can rather the town continue gathering information needed to make fully informed decisions in the interest of the town and town employees based on the benefits consultants findings. So, Margaret, I, this means I, I uh, previously. Go ahead, Scott. Just say, just that uh, uh, I, I think this is the right direction. I've shared with with Margaret earlier that after the last conversation, I, uh, who used to be, I think, a big proponent trying to push this through for July one of this year, that I really was thinking that's no longer the sort of right course of action. I would like both to have us the time to do some both good due diligence, but I think also some time to allow uh, the employees uh, and the union representatives to work with the town to see if there is a good. Uh, solution out there. I have some uh, out of there idea, social justice ideas that, that we could incorporate that we couldn't under the chapters that we adopted, where potentially people could pay a percentage of their salaries instead of a flat fee so that uh, those people earning more pay more towards their health insurance and those earning less pay less towards it. Uh, they help get that social equity done, which again, we couldn't have done under the chapters that we had that we could look into. And so I, uh, I am very much in favor of this uh, I, I like this, and, and I, I hope that it gets us a solution way better than we would have gotten had we sort of tried to push things through fast for this July, this town meeting. Okay. Thanks. So then, so Margaret, um, so basically July 1 of <clears throat> this year, it's still kind of weird to say 2021, um, we stay as is for benefits, yeah. and then throughout this but time we, we start to look. Uh, that would be the intent of this, is okay. to not make any fast changes. But meanwhile, all through this spring, from now until June 30th and then beyond, yep. um, there's going to have to be a lot of work done in the background yep. to do our due diligence and to get yep. all the information that, that we need um, and the employees need. So it's not a pause by any means. It's a right. let's let's keep working on this. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. Mean, I Obviously, think some of, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say some of the some of the ideas that you had, Scott. I think might be good to run by um, Jill from uh -huh. uh, and and Sue. Uh -huh. um, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. I think that we really need to take our time to um, do this right and the inclusion of IAC and, you know, um, carry on conversations with them to hear what they have to say too. Because mm -hmm. pretty much you can do it right or you can do it right now. Pick one, you can't do both. So which one do we want to do? I've, I've communicated this, um, you know, my, my recommendation to the benefits consultant and um, the existing members of the IAC too. So just to keep everybody in the loop that um, this is what I was going to propose. Okay. And uh, um, did you, would you like a vote on this or? I, mm, I don't know if a vote <laughs> is, I don't know. What, well, you know what? Why don't you just, I, I, I'd appreciate, I'd appreciate a motion on my recommendation. How's that? Yes. That's what I was going to say. I, I, I so move to support the recommendation of the town administrator on a new timeline. Agreed. Second. Okay. Um, we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. It's unanimous. 
And I guess we can move on to the FY22 budget. Okay, I'll try to be, I'll try to be succinct here. Um, the good news is that the items, the, the line items that I um, am recommending uh, the board's support on tonight, um, most of them did come with uh, detailed backup or the budget requests came with detailed backup. So hopefully you've had a chance to look at those. There are two lines, however, that I'm going to ask to hold on. Um, on the moderator salary, that's one. I, I did put elected officials salaries in for tonight showing the 2%, but I have not heard back from the moderator on the proposed 2% uh, increase. So I'm gonna ask to, uh, to hold on that tonight. Um, on the other ones, um, on selectman salary, assessor salary, town clerk salary, and I believe Board of Health uh, salary, I have calculated the 2% in those um, based on the personnel committee's recommendations um, because those uh, town officials have historically increased with those, um, with those uh, recommendations for COLA increases. Um, so that's, those are the wage lines. Do you have any question on the elected official wage lines at this point? I I would prefer the select board salaries not go up by 2%. Okay. How do you feel, Meg? I'm okay with that too. You know, um, I, everybody has to do their part. And I think that we would be just a tad bit hypocritical if we told everybody else, no, 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 you know, cut your budget and we're like, woo, we get our increase. So I'm, I go yeah. back, Scott, um, that uh, I'm good with the selectmen. Um, Skipping your increase. I, I do get that it's insignificant in a fifteen million dollar budget, but I think it's, it, I, it's, it's the it's a perception. It's the setting yes. the tone. Agreed. And I, I actually was thinking about that myself as I was looking through um, the FY twenty two budget uh, information in the Google Drive. Yep. So I would agree with the two of you. So that's going to be level. We'll just. That one. Okay, now for expense lines. Um, I'm going to start with uh, 145, 5170. That's the treasurer collector um, incentive. Um, in accordance with statute, a statute that the town um, adopted, uh, I think probably more than a few years ago, if the treasurer collector receives certification from his or her association, um, there is a $1,000 uh, incentive payment that is made annually by the town. And this year, FY21, Dennis did achieve that certification. Um, that is something that actually should be um, uh, funded in FY21, but it's definitely, it definitely needs to be budgeted for FY22. Agree. Now under Dennis's expense lines, um, Dennis has um, submitted a budget request that is reduced by eight um, expense line is reduced by $8,944. That removes um, some of the funding that was uh, deemed unnecessary for the benefits consultant and some other things as well. However, he is looking at a software transition uh, from Point, which is that DOS-based software that the Treasure Collector's Office has had for years and years. Um, and um, very, very few munis municipalities are even using it anymore. Uh, he wants to uh, do a conversion to VADAR, which would actually be tied um, more to the accountants, um, the accountant system, which would help with their reconciliations and things. I talked with Dennis about these requests. He noted them at the bottom of his budget request um, and asked him if he would be amenable to putting a special article on the warrant rather than incorporating these into the operating budget because these are not recur recurring costs. These are gonna be one-time conversion costs. And so rather than put it into the operating budget as your typical recurring cost, um, just reflected in the special article as a one-time cost. I don't know what the town's history, um, oh, what the town has historically done as far as these one-time um, costs, but you know, my experience has been that with these things, they're typically pulled out and put in a special article for funding since they are one time. Is there any annual fees? There will be annual fees that are incurred, but he's already paying those with points. So, so, so some right. of his operating budget that's already being paid to the current software would be paid to the um, to the new 
software. Right. So, um, but he was fine uh, with doing this as a standalone. So if the board is supportive of doing it that way um, and not bundling it into the operating budget, um, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Um, but the what, next... what, what is he advertising? I'm sorry, what is he advertising? He's added 400, he added, he went from zero advertising in 2020 to $450 worth of advertising in 2022. What is the advertising that he is doing that he has not done historically? Um, I didn't see that in the backup, although one page is too blurry for me to, to read. So I could easily be on that. To advertise, I, this is not under tax takings, but he does need to advertise tax delinquent properties, properties that are laid on their taxes. So I can't. Uh, I'd have to ask him. I apologize if it's not it's in this. I, I can't really explain exactly what other. I don't have a giant are. problem with it because he has cuts in other places, and so it could be the advertising is taking place of something else in the in the budget. His total budget went down, even if you, you know, don't count for other things. So it could be, just, or may, yeah, then maybe it's just that he's he's shifted that sub, yep. you know, that sub amount to the advertising yep. line uh, properly. Uh, but I can I can check with him on that. Yep. Um, okay. Next are um, election and uh, election wages um, and uh, registration wages. So election wages and registration part time wages are all paid at minimum wage. So this is really a cut and dry line. It's based on a certain number of hours needed for um, election and registration work. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the part time wages line for expenses. I'm mean, sorry, for elections or registration. Um, mm -hmm. Registration salary is a payment made to the town clerk for serving as a member of the Board of Registrars under Chapter 41, Section 19G. Um, and that's where that $100 stipend comes from. That's a statutory mm -hmm. stipend that's paid to the town clerk. Um, the next... Uh, next one, plumbing and gas, uh, plumbing and gas inspector wages and electrical inspector wages. Um, while there has been some back and forth about the uh, projected um, amount of permit fees or the yeah, projected dollar amount of permit fees, the inspectors um, would be getting in FY22 now that Riverbridge is done. There are other developments on the horizon and the offset receipts directly pay the inspector's wages. So my recommendation right. is to approve, I'm sorry, go ahead. Don't go finish. I think you're about no, to answer so my, my question. My recommendation sorry. is to actually fund the expense budget and include the offset receipts as the direct offset to these costs. Um, the inspectors would only be paid for the actual permit costs that are incurred. Right, okay. right. So, so that these two numbers for plumbing and gas and electrical inspector wages are really offset by incomes. And so that That's those correct. numbers might, might to some people look high, but it's because the town's bringing in that. If the town for some reason our electrical inspections did Fifteen hundred dollars next year, not a hundred thousand next year. His payment wouldn't be a hundred thousand. His payment would be whatever the percentage we agreed to for the fifteen hundred. Now it's not going to be fifteen hundred because we, we have enough historical data. But that's the example. Exactly. That and, is precisely. And for my time on FinCom, you want to budget this high because uh, when the town meeting passes a budget, this is as much for people listening. It's, but if the town meeting passes a budget, we can't pay more than that. And so if electoral inspections came in at two hundred thousand in income. Uh, we couldn't pay him 200,000 because the town limited it to 100,000 and we'd actually have problems on our hands. So you actually want this number to be a little higher than you expect it to be. Yeah, yes, um, and, and it has been. So um, mm -hmm. the plumbing and gas inspector did do his due diligence and, and did reduce um, his anticipated, um, anticipated fees um, fairly significantly by $35,000 on the budget. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the electrical inspector with any solar projects and any other um, any other big projects still expects, it still expects the 100,000. Uh, uh, you have one four next to both uh, police, public fa safety expenses and fire expenses. Are we skipping those? No. Oh, did I? 
Oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. I did. I accidentally skipped those. I had highlighted them too. All right. So, uh, po please. Let's do it's please. spreadsheets. When we're on spreadsheets, I ask a thousand oh, questions. So. I even, I even <laughs> skipped. I even skipped data systems. I have that here too. So that was from page page one. That's um, account one fifty five fifty yep. seven hundred. Yep. Um, data systems, you did get all the detailed backup on that uh, from the chief. That includes, um, that includes several different contracts. It includes our IT uh, vendor contract with CM Geeks. It includes our town phone system. It includes all town internet. It includes our Gmail accounts. Um, it includes our copier and printer uh, leases and print, uh, print management services agreement. Um, it includes our website uh, contract. It includes um, the setup of new computers, um, which we have started to actually do a three-year lease. Um, and at the end of that three-year lease, we're buying out the computer. So we're actually going to be able to be on a PC replacement uh, cycle. Um, but there is a fee for setup of each of the new units um, at $300 a piece. Um, the Dell leases are included here, and now a new e-fax service, which we're transitioning from the copper from the copper wire faxer. And, so that, all of this. and to be clear, that the eighty-five thousand uh, dollars by line by uh, does not include any of the software used by the assessor's office or the accountant's office or the treasurer's office. That is all included in their own budgets as well. Correct. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. These are the town wide. These are the town wide systems that are in the uh, the data systems budget. Margaret, okay. is there ever an opportunity for the data systems? I mean, I know that we can all um, link up, uh, you know, through the Wi-Fi, but no one can print. So if I was to go down to the town offices for something and I needed to print, I'd have to kindly bang on your door, June's door, Mary's door. Um, is there any way that there can be access? Uh, you know, I envision when we all start going back into the office and instead of Mary printing out 85 different things for all of us, if there's just something that we need like a quint print of that we could just sit at our laptop and go doink and walk into the room and get it. Is there mm -hmm. any discussion on being able to print when you're in the building, unless you're hardwired so in? If you would like, Margaret, I can take some of this just since this is my job full time go, away from the town. You go you right go, ahead, Scott. and then I'll and give so, you my perspective. So, right, because there's there's a distinction between what is technologically possible and what we want to do from a policy standpoint. <clears throat> and so I can tell you it's technologically possible. We have actually set up at my office a lot of printers that if you're in the Chrome browser and your computer's on the same network as that Chrome browser that you can actually print uh, to certain printers within our facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is technologically possible and is actually not super difficult to, to set up. Um, and and they're, depending on who you talk to, there's either zero security concerns about that or obscene security about that. I have been of the mindset that it is, the cost benefit is definitely worth it from a uh, what we get out of it versus the risks. Uh, but we'd have to have a talk of a town because there's both cost for every piece of paper that's printed and mm -hmm. how you control it so that someone, a uh, resident in town doesn't just come off the street unless that's a service mm -hmm. we decide we want to offer, but right. just come off the street, go in with their Chrome browser or their personal laptop and start printing to, right. to our devices causing town expenses. Isn't there logins of some kind you can do? We could do password protected something. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing even virtually it could be secured, right, Scott? Yes. Okay. All right. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't want to open it up to the town. I'm just saying like all the town employees, uh, you know, if you need something for a meeting that needed to be printed off or whatever, instead of, you know, can you print, can you print, right. um, you know, yeah. that it's, it's just like our laptops yep. and then, you know, everybody down your end of the hall, Margaret, and then down the other side of the hall that mm -hmm. would have access. It's got to be and, town and, business too. Right. Correct. And, and, and sadly, or, depending on your security stuff for a great business that Google four days ago uh, retired Google Cloud Printing, which allowed you to have a local server so that I could, in theory, print to, to uh, authorize printers from like remote places where, in theory, Margaret could print things from her house or Peg, you mm. could print something from your house to the town printers. Right. That is not that is significantly more difficult to pull off at this point. And we at my office haven't figured out a solution. We've also decided we don't have a need that just mm. uh, that, that we'll do it in different ways. Mm -hmm. So just a question, didn't know um, if yep. that was that capability. 
Thank you for answering that, Scott. I can talk gets, about concerns with, you know, right. paper being used for non-town purposes and blah, right. blah, blah. blah. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things, if I could do it without it feeling like a select board member micromanaging something else, because I'd rather not, this is my area of expertise, is all of these contracts for, for uh, computer replacements and phone systems and other pieces like that, and, and have have very broadly talked to, to Chief Galvin about it before I was on the select board. But uh, if there is a way to do that and provide some of those expertise without overstepping select board boundaries, I'd be willing to do that. Uh, I can also tell you, I from what I've, if I saw a major concern, if I thought you were going a major wrong direction, I would step in, but I've not seen anything that makes me think you've done anything but the right direction on both the phone systems and the fax server and the other stuff that you've gone. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, to credit, I have to credit Chief Galvin. He's, he's much more technologically savvy uh, than I am. And he's done a lot of this trying to um, consolidate our systems, getting us off, you know, old fax machines. Really, yep. this is, um, this is a major step um, yep. 20th, 21st century. All right, so onward and upward, uh, police expense line. Um, so the chief is looking to reduce his um, expense line by $2,346. And you talked to him a little earlier about the cost uh, for accreditation. Um, I think he feels that he could absorb some of this cost in his, um, in his budget. But one of the reasons that he's able to level fund, and this is, a, this is uh, applicable to all three, all, all of the big three, is the cost of uh, petroleum, uh, fuel products, gasoline, diesel, that has been very, very stable. It's uncertain where it's going to go next year, uh, but there aren't signs at this point that those costs are going to skyrocket. So this in large part has allowed um, all three of these departments to, uh, to maintain uh, level funded or, or slightly reduced um, expense lines. Um, so uh, the chiefs, the chief's um, expenses, the things that he incurs in his expense line, um, there's gonna be a lot of similarities between uh, his expense line and the fire departments. Um, he has the uh, cell phone service for his officers that he pays for, uh, the uniforms that um, the expense line pays for. They do all their, they do their trainings and certifications. Um, they pay for the ammunition, um, the, the, weapons uh, maintenance, um, specialized trainings for police officers, uh, bulletproof vests, um, and um, they actually still do, um, for whatever reason, the Berlin's police department actually takes on the cost of the, um, uh, the medical, the syringes disposal that's in the public safety lobby. I, where, where it'd been before, it's always been, um, you know, fire EMS, but um, he pays for the disposal of the um, of the hazardous waste um, and, and things like that. He has dropped for FY22 a couple of services um, that the department had um, contracted for in uh, prior years. Uh, first of all, public relations services, and to be perfectly honest, I don't I don't, I'm not fully aware of what those services um, actually provided. If Chief was here, he'd be able to better explain. And then a firearms consulting um, service that they had previously done, and he doesn't feel the need uh, to continue to do that. So um, that pretty much sums up the police department's expense lines. Are there any questions on that that you need me to follow up on? No? The, the um, box that they had uh, putting, was it medication and syringes down in the lobby? It is. It's that yeah. one. Yes. That's the disposal that the police I always department. thought that that was if someone came and took those things. I didn't know they had to pay to get rid of it. Yes. It's, um, yeah, the town pays to um, to dispose of those, those, those materials. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and then on to highway, uh, same thing with petroleum products. And this uh, for highway, this also applies to road patch, 
um, and, and things of that nature. Anything that has petroleum is petroleum based. Uh, but Dave has done an, a reasonable job outlining um, the different areas of his expense line. You can see that uh, truck maintenance alone represents uh, $43,000 of his, uh, his budget, his expense budget request. Um, and then there are significant costs uh, for line striping this, uh, the streets, uh, guardrails and bridge maintenance, um, contract uh, tree removal, he calls them sky workers in his, um, in his budget request, um, and then uh, drainage supplies, gravel, stone, and things of that nature. So his total request, total highway expense request, is level funded at, um, at last year's amount at $143,920. A couple of years ago, there was a significant increase in his expense line, but that was due in large part to the cost of petroleum products. So that bumped up uh, everything in that line. So do they do it? Do they have a service that does the lines on the road now? They do. They have a contract. Uh, there's a contractor that comes in and does the line striping. Yeah. Well, don't you don't you remember though, Peg and Scott, when they used to do it themselves, and the <laughs> line kind of went like this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's much more scientific it now. Give the community <laughs> character. It was. Uh, Margaret, in, in, in this budget, internet, phone, and TV, I thought you mm -hmm. said under data systems, they pay for the town-wide stuff for that. Why is there $3,300 of the highway budget for that? I think that is because, I shouldn't have said the town-wide thing. I think it's because it's a different building. I think that's that's strictly right. the reason. So, I can, I can so, follow up. Let me follow up with Chief on that and find out why it's not captured in the data system's budget as opposed and to. And then um, cell phones, uh, although they're allocated departments, we have one centralized contract for cell phones, right? We don't have every department negotiating their own rates and stuff, do we? Different departments have different cell phone um, carriers. Um, and that's something that we need to work on. And Peg, I know you've, you've asked uh, this question mm -hmm. in the past. Um, highway department's cell phone contract actually happens to be a very, very reasonably, there's reasonably priced uh, cell phones under this contract. Um, but inspections, fire, police, and highway all have, all have different uh, cell phone. Because uh, that has to be a support nightmare too, nightmare. because if they're all with the same vendor and the same contracts, that just mm -hmm. makes it easier to swap things between them and get replacement mm -hmm. parts. And state rates should be pretty, the town can access state contract rates, correct? I mean, if I at work in the Cactus State contract yes. race, you think a town could? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's something that we need to work on consolidating between all of the departments because um, I, I think it's a long, long-standing. Um, I guess. I guess I thought that Chief Galvin was um, sort of doing that for each department. No, huh? Um, no, but I don't think, I mean, and, and he probably wants to, um, this is something that has been longstanding, um, with each of the departments and we, we do have to get them on the same page. Um, but yeah. If any of them understand contract rates, there's no penalty for early termination or moving around. And so it should, the, there's not a friction. And so we should at least, at least make whatever vendor there are with, that each one of them gets on the state contract rate so that it's not difficult to merge them all into one at some point if there's a vendor we like. Mm -hmm. Now I say that at my office, we have two vendors, but we also have, a, we also have 1200 phones. And so I have two vendors so that I can play them against each other and we can give someone the service that's best at their houses, uh, which yeah. you know, the town probably has what, 20 or 30. And so that's not as practical. Right. Um, no, there is potential to align them all. Um, I think there is potential uh, cost savings uh, with some of the departments. The needs of the different departments um, differ, but that's not something mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's insurmountable. I think that we mm -hmm. can, we can address those uh, needs, but, um, but yeah, that's something that we're going to have to work on uh, consolidating the cell phone. Thanks. Um, any other contracts, uh, any of the contracts, any other questions on highway? Um, so we've level funded way. them, but we've talked about the importance of taking out dangerous and hazardous trees. Isn't this the opportunity to put something in the fiscal 22 budget if we wanted to do more with trees? Um, Is that... 
It, it could potentially be. Um, the capital planning committee had approved um, prior to COVID, had approved $60,000 for contract tree removal to be able to tackle a large number of trees. Okay. This, this particular item that's in the budget only will do hold on, uh, 10, 10 days. days. 10 yep. days. And so just a handful of trees um, as the need comes up. It and so this 15,000 is basically to keep us even with the number of trees that need to be taken down and the the capital we number is to actually take care of the backlog. That's right. This is um this is to react to uh, yep. tree issues. Okay. Um, Thanks. It's something that we can certainly still look at and the capital planning committee is still talking about um is still talking about options with respect to mm -hmm. um, dealing with all the hazard trees. Um, mm -hmm. Which, by the way, and I don't want to get too far off topic here because I know everybody wants to go home. <laughs> so um, I did actually last year, Scott, I don't know if you were you followed any of this last year, but last year um, when the, the capital request of a bucket truck came up, we mm -hmm. actually did a little bit of work with CMRPC and contacted surrounding towns to see if there was any potential uh, for a regionalized purchase or shared purchase of bucket where um, different towns could use them according to, uh, use the bucket according to a certain schedule. Um, and this came up once we um, switched over the light fixtures to town owned LED light fixtures. So it mm -hmm. wasn't just about trees, it was about light fixtures as well. Um, most of the towns actually had, um, either already had a bucket truck or had some other mechanism which they were they were using bucket truck services, whether it was through their municipal light department or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, but I reached, uh, based on the capital planning committee's request from their last meeting, I reached out to the town of Clinton again today uh, because they were a town that we, we actually continued discussing this with. And they actually are still uh, potentially interested um, in the sharing of a bucket truck. So it could make sense. Um, and they're especially interested, and as, as I think we might, we might be a little more interested, um, with the um, Community Compact is putting out a new regionalization and efficiency grant round. It's going to be opening on March 15th. Mm. And this is one of those projects looking at something like this that could definitely qualify under that particular grant program. Mm -hmm. So I told the administrator in Clinton today that we continue to look um, at that possibility. Um, and I reached out to Dave to get his thoughts on it. Um, and I'll report back to the capital planning committee, but <laughs> in, a, in a big roundabout way, the mm -hmm. issue of tree removal, you know, we're looking at a bunch of different options. Good. Okay. okay. So on to fire and EMS, um, the, there really wasn't a, a detail um, with the fire and EMS uh, budget request on expenses. However, um, I, I pulled up uh, detailed expenditure reports to try to get a sense of the largest, um, the largest pieces of this budget. Um, clearly truck maintenance, uh, gas and diesel, uh, truck repairs and upgrades, uh, uniforms for the department, um, office supplies are very common, um, memberships training, the wireless, the cell phone wireless service, ALS intercepts are a huge part of this particular um, expense budget. Um, they do have some operation software, um, OCI software that they charge to um, the expense line. Um, I'd already talked about um, equipment, um, equipment replacement. Um, I said office supplies and things. I think I've, I've pretty much uh, touched on the biggest chunks. Um, ALS intercepts, ALS intercepts being one of the, the largest costs in this budget. So the chief has submitted a budget request that is level funded, which means that he anticipates that the ALS intercepts um, will remain, or the costs will remain fairly stable over the next year. This is something that we're going to have to watch closely because um, Patriot Ambulance Service is our primary 
um, ALS contractor. Um, the town of Northboro uh, recently went way, way, way up on their ALS intercept costs, and we are avoiding um, uh, having them come in if and whenever um, it's possible uh, to get Patriot here instead. So this um, expense line is level funded. Are there any questions on the fire and EMS expense line? Margaret, I know that we had discussions on a potential uh, chaser car ourselves, you know, that we ha or taking one of the ambulances, you know, we have uh, personnel that is trained uh, to administer whatever you need to administer. I mean, where is that discussion uh, to either get a truck or put somebody in another ambulance and get them out to wherever they need to go to stop ALS from coming in? So where we left off with this particular conversation was that the town needs to understand what the true ALS costs will be to the town. So the mm -hmm. town needs to understand um, whether or not um, it, it needs an ALS service or whether it is more cost effective or more efficient to continue to run with ALS intercepts. Um, the town needs to understand whether there's opportunities for uh, a regional uh, ALS program mm -hmm. um, and also whether or not maybe a fly car option or right. something like that would be an option. So where we left off was in the discussion on the special town meeting warrant, we were going to look for funding from public safety mitigation funds to fund an ALS, mm -hmm. uh, ALS consulting study right. uh, to determine what the need is in Berlin, what staffing costs uh, would be over time to bump up the staffing, uh, and what other options there would be as far as ALS. So needless to say, the special town meeting has been delayed, but that okay. still should be a first step in looking at ALS services in town. Okay. And lastly, not la yes, lastly, we're going to be holding on Medicare, by the way, that was my last line. I'm gonna ask that the board hold on that. Uh, lastly is the library expense line. Uh, they too have requested a level funded um, uh, expense line for FY22. Uh, their costs include um, library materials. So books, periodicals, DVDs, uh, children's, um, li children's materials, um, uh, library supplies, some uh, supplies for the copy machine um, and general office supplies. Um, the alarm system for that building, um, repair of their copy machine postage that they may need, um, spectrum, which is custom in the library's case, is custom to the library. Um, their contract actually pays for their um, CW Mars uh, system, so they need to be on a separate uh, spectrum contract. Uh, con uh, tract which by the way, uh, Spectrum began billing for this past fiscal year. They had never been billed for that before, but uh, they are now getting billed for it. So they are looking at level funding their expense line. Um, and this is, um, this is important with respect to the um, materials expenditure requirements that the libraries have um, and the state aid that the libraries get. Um, if this, if the library is not disproportionately, the library's budget is not disproportionately redu be, uh, reduced compared to other departments, they will not suffer any consequences on the state, um, the state funding side. Um, so they would not um, have to forfeit any of the state funding they receive on our cherry sheets. And I, I always pay close attention to this because we don't want them to have to suffer any kind of reductions in their state aid. So by level funding this, by level funding the other um, departments expense lines, we are on a, an even, uh, a level playing field. Um, so they should, not, they should not be suffering any state aid um, losses. In fact, I would expect that the Mass Board of Library Trustees um, would, uh, do something like uh, they did with the um, the recession in the, I think it was in the 90s or the early 2000s, where they actually, um, they didn't issue blanket waivers, but all libraries qualified for la uh, for waivers if, if necessary in order to retain their state, their state aid. So 
That's the libraries. Do you have any any questions on the libraries expenditure line? At how much state aid do we get for the libraries? That one is about. Uh, um, oh gosh, I want to say I don't have the oh, I don't have the revenue sheet in front of me. I want to say it's about four thousand dollars. It's a, a little over four thousand dollars, I believe. Um, I can double check that. Okay. I don't have the cherry sheet in front of me. Just want to make sure we're not going through extraordinary measures to get like twenty dollars from the state. Yeah, I think it's I think it's about I think it's a little over four thousand dollars. I could yep. be wrong. I'll double check and get it get that to you. That's fine. All right, and then finally, Medicare. I, I'm not going to ask the board um, to um, to support uh, a recommendation on this because we do need to hold for FY22 payroll adjustments in order to determine what the accurate Medicare costs or Medicaid costs. I'm sorry, Medicare costs are going to be um, in the coming fiscal year. So I'm I'm just gonna, I'm going to ask for a hold on that. One. And that's oh, it. Kudos, kudos to you in June um, for getting all the other. Uh, budgets that we're not in in i mean there's just really the the rec expenses that are in review and then of course yes. the inter uh intergovernmental ones but uh you know hats off margaret and june and amy and whoever else is on that whipping committee to get everyone's budget in so thank you mm -hmm. all right so you would like a vote on these additional uh line items correct Yes, please. And I have noted that uh, the select board has asked for that salary line to be level funded. And I have noted um, that the Medicare line would be uh, is to be held. So, uh, and the We're moderator holding, salary and is the moderator. Also. Yep. Yeah. And the moderator, right? Yep. Okay. okay. With those three three changes, though, we would. Uh, would do we have a motion to support? Uh, uh, I I do so move. I. Move to support her recommendations for one four minus those three changes. Okay. And and that includes our selectman salary, Margaret. You got that one too? Yep. Yes, Josh Scott shaking yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then I second. Okay. Uh, we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone aye. Hawkins, aye. Thank you. We're getting there. Next up, I we um we do have to calculate the um the personnel committee's recommended colas before we plug in other um, numbers and other wage lines. So we'll work on that. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to new business. Uh, review of the draft Clinton item article. Yeah, so there were, um, the one that's out there um, doesn't contain Chris's changes, but Chris's changes were very small. You know, of course, Peg put typos in there on purpose so that Chris would find yeah. them. <laughs> and of course, Scott, Scott will not find them. There you go. And Scott will not find them. And Peg has seen them 85 times. So she just glosses over them. Well, you um, know, we all have our jobs, don't this we? Is, yep. This is true, you know, and I appreciate that. So honestly, the, the changes were very, very um, minor that right. Chris made. But you have that copy somewhere, right? I do. It's in an email. Yep. And I can, uh, I'll include you guys on the, uh, if we approve this to uh, get out to, uh, uh, Jan, uh, question on the meals that were delivered. Um, what is that final number? It went up, didn't it? It did. I believe I, I can only, unfortunately, I can only tell you the number of households. It was 85 households. I think. Okay. Um, because it was, here it's 150. So, you know, I no, can just put the little two oh, in. Yeah, it's about, I think it was a, more like 155 meals. All right. All right, and so I'll do like maybe, approximately. Ooh, I thought it was more than that, Margaret. I thought it was like one. Oh, maybe 165. No, I thought it was 167 or something in that range. Oh, geez, but so. okay. But I think, uh, Peg, if it just said more than 150. Okay, all right. Where are you? We'll be, we'll, it will be safe. Email, email Victoria. Yeah. We'll tell you right off the top of her head. Yep. I'm sure they're still adding people to the list yeah. today, so. Of course they are. <laughs> all right. No, no, they're not. Because here is done. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. It was yeah. done. Yes, it was a great Brand event. It was year. wonderful. <laughs> I'm so happy the town did it, and she took a lead. Yeah, but no, I wanted to um, kind of like close out our 2020, and and you know, as I said, yeah. our our rays of light, you know, and and rays of hope, uh, you know, and look at all the good things that um, have happened truly in just right. a very short amount of time. It, 
And I like it. I'd like us to also just consider as we go forward that some things just could be their own articles that we don't need just one article per month about the town of yeah. Berlin. And so if we could do other announcement things, yep. uh, uh, that that would be good. Again, like the the plastic ban, plastic bag ban being postponed mm -hmm. could be its own little article. Mm -hmm. Um, and there could be others that come up that just are yeah. better as sort of a standalone article than part of a town update. Yeah. Peg, on December 28th, there were 163 meals. Oh, okay. All right, I will update and then include you all. Awesome. And Scott, yeah. the library state aid for FY21 yep. was $4,720. Thank you, Thank Jim. you. <laughs> I said Stay I was going to name that number. I knew it was four thousand somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with Scott. The more that we can push out, you know, either through the item or, um, you know, I know that Peter Hoffman has taken this and pushed it out through Berlin Connect, and I know that Mary posts it, um, you know, just to get it out to the town mm -hmm. to show kind of like what's what's going on and what we're doing and what all the other departments are doing. It, it just speaks, it just speaks well, there, to the town. There's a multitude of different ways that people Correct. get the communication. Mm -hmm. So yep. good to touch on all of them as much as we can. I mean, uh, the EDC earlier today, you know, they have an announcement they'd like to get out to businesses. There's not a good email list of businesses to get things out there. And yeah. if the town could do those, because every now and then we do a rule change that affects businesses to be able to send it out saying, hey, by the way, uh, so that it's not just, you know, the business that doesn't normally come to town meeting, which is a lot of them, especially the ones in the mall, uh, don't get to hear about things six weeks out. Because I'm sure the business that bought six months worth of bags might not have bought six months worth of bag and it had been on the radar somehow. And we just didn't do a right. great job of getting that out there. Right. Okay. Do you uh, want to vote for this, Peg? Or do you, I mean, I, I thought it looked fine, except for the typos I corrected. <laughs> Yeah, and big red lettering, Chris. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, right. as I said, it's 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 minor, and I'll definitely include you guys um, on the shout out to Jan, so she can get this in the item for Friday. Okay. Coolio, appreciate it. All right, and we've got uh, the Insurance Advisory Committee. Um, the Fire Department's bargaining unit designee is David Litchwell. Um, Bargaining unit has an ability, or bargaining units have an ability to designate um, representatives from their unit to serve on the IAC. So I would just ask the board to ratify that designation. Not a problem. And seconded. Okay. Uh, Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. There we go. And the Insurance Advisory Committee, the non bargaining unit appointments. And these are select board appointees. So the town, um, it's been 10 days. We have kind of a 10 day rule for notice and postings of uh, vacancies. Mm -hmm. And it's been a little more than 10 days now since um, I sent notices to departments. We have, or the board has received uh, three volunteer application forms from active employees. And there are three vacancies for active employees on the IAC. Uh, so first is June Poland. Next is Molly Reed. And then the last one is Richard Hanks. So all three submitted volunteer application forms. And my recommendation is that the board appoint these individuals, these employees to the IAC. Sounds I moved. <laughs> good to be second. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. Thank you. And thanks to the, the individuals for stepping up. Yes, this is great. And Thank you, June. So so how is a uh, retiree representative? I mean, does it have to be someone, if they're retired, then would it be outside of the municipal government? So it actually can be a retiree. There is a retiree board at the state level and they can actually have a designee participate in discussions here. But we could also reach out to town retirees, even though they're not, you know, even though we don't have retiree health insurance, we could reach out to our own town retirees and see if there's somebody that might want to sit on as a retiree uh, representative. So, I mean, I know we don't have retiree health insurance. Um, and Dennis, does, does he, is he privy to any, 
anybody that he would know that like it's a recent, I haven't, I haven't recent asked, I haven't asked retiree him. Or, or something from town government? I haven't asked him. I can ask him if he has any, any thoughts oh. or suggestions um, just to get someone to the table. Um, the, the IAC does have a quorum. Um, uh, so while we're searching for a retiree, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can proceed with <laughs> meetings anyway. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, we're down to board questions and comments. Did we take care of all the questions? Uh, Margaret, yeah. the, the state asked land use boards to start meeting again. Yes. Uh, have we, as our ZBA, have we found and helped the ZBA find a safe way to hold their meetings? Are they I having actually, meetings? I actually talked with Lynn Ryan today. She's worked with, um, she's worked with town council and Leanne on setting up their meetings. They're going to be doing it remotely and they're doing everything they can to accommodate individuals who might have technology uh, challenges. So for example, uh, they have provided a hard copy of the set of, of a set of plans to uh, an individual. But they are going to be conducting their hearing. Um, they have an upcoming hearing. I can't remember mm -hmm. when she said uh, in the near future. It's going to be it's going to be virtual. It might, it might so, be this week. Okay. Yeah, it's, I just, it's coming up. I, I think the state put them in an impossible spot. And so anything we can do as a team to help make them slightly less impossible, I, I, I wanted us to be doing. Yeah. Um, and, and how about something out of left field here? Um, at one point when we were starting to talk about uh, staffing the fire department, uh, there was talk about working on the upstairs of uh, Linden Street mm -hmm. to start creating some sleeping spaces for them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as we continue to grow the staffing and it looked like the fire department budget was continuing to inc increase the staffing and I think their calls justify it. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we looking at, at improving their spaces? And that's going to be a big capital need at some point, isn't it? Well, it's that's an that's a great question because it's a question that was actually brought up at the capital planning committee, and so we looked a little bit into that. Um, so the public safety, there was a capital request that came in to replace the public safety building's roof. Right. And when that question came up, one of the Capital Planning Committee members asked, well, is replacing the roof going to cause disruption when the upper story of the public safety complex is built out for sleeping quarters? And so I asked that question of Chief, and he said, yes, he would hold off on the fire side or that, that part of the, the roof. Um, but there was a, a capital request that came in this year. So Clearly, it's still on the radar, and we're going to have to tackle that. Um, uh, but because it's ultimately, a, it's a it, right. It's a multi-year thing. Because the first year, you want, probably want to do a feasibility study, and then another year, you want to do the architectural drawings. And then, if it still looks like it's a good idea, then you start doing a one that actually might go to funding for it. So, mm -hmm. I, I, think, yeah. I really felt as though that might have been one particular fire chief's uh, idea. It could be. It could I'm be because really there's sure eight, there's ADA fun. issues because are we going to need an elevator because you have to yeah. make any space ADA stuff? Well, there is sort of an elevator in the building, but, yeah, I, I but think still, I mean, are, that fire chief was gone. I don't think that it's even come up. There okay. are issues, and I'm going to be. I, I mean, in my in my prior experience, I've seen I, I've seen the build outs like this, the requests for build outs like this, primarily with um, departments that do 24 hour shifts as opposed right. to 12 hour shifts. Mm -hmm. But then again, maybe that is maybe a 24 hour yep. shift is planned for the future. So, um, but the chief, you know, the chief responded and it's obviously still on, um, you know, on the plate, on the targeted radar. projects at some point so, yep. <laughs> on the radar. Sure. That, that was my list. Okay. Thank you. You all set? I'm all set. I've got all my questions answered. Oh, I, okay. Can I, I got a couple real quick. Yay. Yay. Um, go Chris. <laughs> so have we got a uh, bin for shredded materials, confidential materials? Yes, we do. Okay. We have, we have two. We're with a new contractor that's charging one third of the price of the former contractor. So yes, we have two uh, large bins at the town. Uh, well, one in the town office, one in public safety. Yep. Okay, because I, I, I don't know, I mean, I have um, 
minutes from 2019 and I didn't know whether it'd be appropriate for me to bring those down and get rid of them if there. They're, if they're town documents that need to be yeah. shred, they can go into the bin. Yep. Okay. That's and the one next to the copier, right? That has a lock on it. It's across, it's across the hall now because it's just way too big to have in the copier room. So okay. it's right across from Eloise's office with a lock on okay. it. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Margaret, are we meeting with um, Superintendent Hooley from Acibet? Tomorrow at noon, we're going to have a, a preliminary uh, budget intro uh, from Ernie and um, Chris oh, is from Acibet. Yes. Is it for, at noon? Okay. Noon. I, for some reason, it's, I it should be okay. about half an hour. So after that, we might have a little bit of a little sense of what's what's okay. in store for Acibet. Mm -hmm. And um, could you send me the link? Is there a link yet? Oh, okay. I wasn't. I, then I must not have sent the link out. Maybe it's still in my draft. I thought I did. <laughs> oh, I didn't know if maybe he was sending it out. No, it's still in my draft folder. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. All right. Just wondered. And that was my questions. All right. Look at that. Easy yeah. peasy. Easy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, having no uh, executive session scheduled for this evening, we could make a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. I seconded. <laughs> okay, Keith, I. Stone Eye. Hawkins Eye.